Good evening. The Florida Department of Transportation would like to welcome you to the public hearing for the International Speedway Boulevard, US 92, State Road 600 corridor improvements. My name is Kathy Enot. I am the project manager for the Florida Department of Transportation. This public hearing is relative to financial projects All right, sorry about that, having a little bit of technical difficulties. Um, good evening, the Florida Department of Transportation would like to welcome you to the public hearing for the International Speedway Boulevard, US 92, State Road 600 corridor improvements. Kathy Ena is the project manager for the Florida Department of Transportation. This public hearing is relative to financial project identification number 437-942-1-32-2. The project limits are from the Halifax River Bridge to State Road A1A in Volusia County. This hearing is being held to provide you with the opportunity to comment on this project. At this time, we would like to thank federal, state, county, or city officials who may be present tonight. For those of you attending in person, when you arrived this, this evening, you were given a folder which contains a comment form, sign-in card, speaker card, and a copy of the proposed improvements with the roundabout option or with the signal option. We ask that you please fill out the signing card and mark if you would like to be added to the project mailing list. Boxes for completed comment forms and signing cards have been provided in the back room. You may also turn these into project staff. If you would like to speak at the microphone this evening, please fill out your speaker card and staff will be by to collect them following the presentation. We will now begin the presentation. Good evening and thank you for your interest in the International Speedway Boulevard corridor improvements from the Halifax River Bridge to State Road A1A. It is 6 p.m. Tuesday, October 1st, 2020. My name is David Dangle. I will be your moderator for this virtual public hearing. If you happen to experience technical issues during the hearing, please report it by using the question pane on the control panel. Staff will do their best to assist you. This hearing is being recorded and will be available for review. Before we start the presentation, let's share a few items to help you better participate in the virtual hearing. For those attending on your computer, you should see a meeting control panel in the upper right hand corner. Click the red arrow to expand the window to view controls. To listen to the hearing, your device speakers are selected by default. If you prefer to listen by phone, select phone call in the audio pane of the control panel and dial in using the information displayed. All attendees will be placed in listen only mode throughout the presentation portion of the hearing. The department encourages the public to participate in the International Speedway Boulevard US 92 corridor improvements project by submitting comments and questions. There are multiple ways to offer comment during this hearing. If you are attending the hearing online, you can type your comments directly into the question pane on the meeting control panel anytime during the hearing. Or if you wish to speak, please enter your name and I wish to speak in the question pane. You will be called on and unmuted in the order your request to speak was received. When called on to speak, please state your name and address before you provide your comment. If you are attending in person from our remote viewing location, you may fill out the provided comment form and drop it in the comment box. Or if you would like to speak, please fill out a speaker card to provide verbal comments at the microphone. Anyone who would like to make a verbal comment will be allowed to following the presentation. If you are attending by phone only, you cannot be unmuted and will not have access to the question pane. Instead, you can easily make comments by contacting FDOT Project Manager Kathy Enot directly by phone at 386-943-5149, by email at Kathleen 
.enot at dot.state.fl.us or by mail at 719 South Woodland Boulevard, Mail Station 542, Deland, Florida, 32720. Please note, comments and questions will not be responded to during this hearing. Written responses to all comments and questions will be provided at a later date. Florida's Department of Transportation encourages you to provide your comments and ask questions throughout the life of the project. However, all comments and questions received by Monday, October 12, 2020, will be included as part of this hearing record. This public hearing is conducted in accordance with Chapter 23, United States Code 128, Title 40, Code of Federal Regulations, Parts 1500 through 1508, and Section 339.155, Florida Statutes. And pursuant Pursuant to Florida Statute 355.199, the Florida Department of Transportation is conducting this public hearing concerning access management changes to State Road 600. This hearing is being held to afford persons the opportunity to express their views relative to the proposed improvements. This project is being carried out in accordance with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act of 1968 as amended. Public participation is solicited without regard to race, color, national origin, age, sex, religion, disability, or family status. Persons wishing to express their concerns relative to FDOT compliance with Title VI may do so by contacting Jennifer Smith, FDOT District 5 Title VI Coordinator, by phone at 386-943 5367 or via email at jennifer.smith2 at dot.state.fl.us. Forms are available for you in English, Spanish, and Haitian Creole with both the local and state Title VI coordinator contact information. All inquiries or complaints will be handled according to FDOT procedure and in a prompt and courteous manner. The project begins at the Halifax River Bridge and extends to State Road A1A in Volusia County. Through the project limits, International Speedway Boulevard is a principal arterial urban roadway and serves as a hurricane evacuation route. We have been working throughout the project with the many stakeholders in the area. The city of Daytona Beach completed a conceptual design study in September of 2013. This study identified three intersections along International Speedway Boulevard for possible roundabouts, which included the intersection with State Road A1A. The FDOT completed the US-92 Corridor Master Management Plan final report in November of 2015. This report recommended improvements for the overall US-92 corridor from Interstate 4 to State Road A1A. The FDOT updated the US-92 Corridor Master Management Plan in October of 2017. The alternatives were presented at a public meeting in February 2017. The ISB coalition requested further analysis at the intersection of International Speedway Boulevard and State Road A1A and for the FDOT to consider a signalized intersection instead of the proposed roundabout. The congestion from beach traffic backing up into the roundabout was their main concern. The FDOT agreed to analyze the operations of a signal at the intersection of International Speedway Boulevard and State Road A1A. The proposed improvements include widening International Speedway Boulevard to provide wider travel lanes and a raised median. Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA, compliant sidewalks and curb ramps will be incorporated throughout the corridor. Additionally, signals will be reconstructed at Halifax Avenue, Peninsula Drive or State Road 441 and Grandview Avenue. The proposed improvements will either include construction of a roundabout to replace the existing signal at the intersection of International Speedway Boulevard and State Road A1A or a signal with additional turn lanes. The proposed improvements for International Speedway Boulevard include a 10 foot wide and 11 foot wide travel lanes in each direction. A 15 and a half foot median provides areas for landscaping. 
Pedestrian facilities will be provided on each side of the roadway. Within the project limits, left turns are currently allowed at all points along International Speedway Boulevard. A median will be constructed from the Halifax River Bridge to the State Road A1A intersection with full median openings at the signalized intersections and either a roundabout or signalized intersection at State Road A1A. The median will be an added improvement on this project regardless of whether the roundabout option or the signal option is selected as the preferred intersection improvement at International Speedway Boulevard and State Road A1A. The median will increase safety by reducing traffic conflict points. Left turn lanes will be provided at the signalized intersections of Halifax Avenue and Peninsula Drive. Left turn lanes will also be provided at the Grandview Avenue intersection. At the State Road A1A intersection, left turn lanes will be provided in the signal option for the roundabout option at the intersection. Access is provided for all turning movements. U-turns are easily accomplished through the roundabout. For the signal option at the intersection of International Speedway Boulevard and State Road A1A, new right turn lanes would be constructed on both eastbound International Speedway Boulevard and southbound State Road A1A. Level of service is one of several ways in which an intersection performance is evaluated. Similar to a report card, level of service is a letter grade, A to F, that is assigned based upon average seconds of delay each vehicle experiences traveling through the intersection. Roundabouts and signals each have different delay thresholds used to define the letter grades based upon differences in driver expectation for yield control versus signal control. These thresholds for each letter grade are nationally standardized. Based upon forecasting of traffic volumes through the design year 2045, the roundabout and signal option are compared on the basis of level of service, as well as the raw average intersection delay per vehicle. For the weekday and Saturday peak hour conditions, both options are viable alternatives. Both provide acceptable level, acceptable delay and level of service through the intersection through the design year 2045. Both also provide an improvement over the existing intersection performance. However, the roundabout results in lower average delay and at least one letter grade better for level of service. Due to its proximity to the beach, pedestrian accommodations are also an important consideration. Both options provide pedestrian crossings on all legs of the intersection. The roundabout provides signalized crossings using pedestrian hybrid beacons on the north, south, and west legs, where a pedestrian would cro cross two lanes. The fourth leg, which has, a signal, which has single lane crossings, will have a raised crosswalk. The signal option provides signal control of all four legs. A benefit for the roundabout is that it provides a median refuge area, which reduces the crossing distances for pedestrians to a maximum of two lanes. By comparison, the traffic signal requires pedestrians to cross between four and six lanes. In addition to shorter crossings, the roundabout also results in fewer conflicts with vehicles. Pedestrians interact with vehicles coming from one direction at a time in comparison to the traffic signal, where a pedestrian interacts with vehicles coming from multiple different directions. However, roundabouts do result in longer travel distances between the crosswalks, which increases the time it takes for a pedestrian to navigate around the intersection. The pedestrian hybrid beacon proposed for the roundabout crosswalks remains dark until the pedestrian activates the push button. The pedestrian hybrid beacon gives a yellow flashing, then solid indication to warn drivers prior to turning a solid red, where vehicles are required to stop and pedestrians begin their crossing. The signal will then go into a flashing red mode for a short period as pedestrians are finishing crossing the roadway. During the flashing red, vehicles may proceed if the crosswalk is clear. Based upon national research and testing, pedestrian hybrid beacons are one recommended treatment at roundabouts to support accessibility for all pedestrians, including those with visual impairments. 
The short two lane crossing distances combined with the pedestrian hybrid beacons flashing red operation, both help to minimize the time that vehicles are required to stop. A similar pedestrian hybrid beacon was re recently installed by the Florida Department of Transportation on International Speedway Boulevard in front of Mainland High School. For bicycle users, both the roundabout and signal option provide comparable accommodations. Cyclists have the option of traveling along the wide sidewalk on the south side of International Speedway Boulevard and around the roundabout. Alternatively, they can claim a travel lane and travel through the intersection as a vehicle, similar to navigating the current intersection. This short simulation video reflects Saturday midday volumes from counts collected in 2019 prior to the recent COVID-19 pandemic. The two alternatives are presented side by side at five times normal speed with the same traffic volumes. Both alternatives are viable and provide improved operations over existing conditions, each with advantages and trade-offs. The roundabout offers some efficiency, providing shorter, constantly moving queues of vehicles with fewer lanes. In comparison, the signal produces longer queues with longer average delay as vehicles wait for their turn in the signal cycle. However, the signal does serve all the queued vehicles during each cycle. Roundabouts offer proven safety performance, including designation by the Federal Highway Administration as one of 20 proven safety countermeasures. This is in large part due to the reductions in injury and fatal crashes at roundabouts. When a traffic signal is converted to a two-lane roundabout, such as the one proposed at the International Speedway Boulevard and State Road A1A intersection, past studies have shown injury and fatal crashes are reduced by an average of 66%. Roundabouts reduce the potential for more severe right angle, left turn, and head-on crashes that can occur at signalized intersections. Instead, crashes at roundabouts tend to be lower severity side swipe, shallow angle, and rear end types. Roundabouts also offer reduced vehicle speeds and reduced number of conflict points that contribute towards the safety performance. Overall, both the roundabout and signal are viable alternatives for the International Speedway Boulevard State Road A1A intersection, with both options offering improved operations over existing conditions. Each offer advantages and trade-offs. The roundabout operates in a more free-flowing manner, which provides some efficiency to serve the forecast traffic volumes with fewer lanes, lower average delay, and enhanced U-turn capabilities. However, the signal provides more flexibility for manual control during special events. Roundabouts may experience operational challenges if cues from adjacent intersections spill back into the roundabout during special events. This can be overcome using police officers to control the entries. However, more police officer manpower may be needed compared to the signal option. For pedestrians, the signal options result in shorter travel distances around the intersection. However, the roundabout results in shorter crossing distances and reduced conflict points with vehicles. The roundabout is also expected to provide advantages related to reducing the potential for vehicular injury and fatal crashes. The project is within the jurisdiction of the St. Johns River Water Management District. The existing stormwater treatment areas and overall drainage plan will be retained. New stormwater conveyance systems replace the existing systems, which are in poor condition. The Florida Department of Transportation recognizes that the success of any transportation improvement is dependent upon a successful public outreach effort. Project newsletters have been distributed to residents and stakeholders. The newsletters include the project location, purpose and need, and information for future public involvement events. Please notice public notice for the virtual public hearing, including information on how to access the hearing platform, was provided in letters to officials, property owners, and tenants in the project area by a posting in the Florida Administrative Register, in emails to persons on the project contact list, on social media feeds, and other notification methods. Notice was also posted on the project website. Extensive data gathering, data gathering activities such as surveying, soil testing, contamination assessments, and investigations of protest, 
protected wildlife have been completed. Our engineers are finalizing the design of the roadway features, identifying stormwater treatment and permitting needs, and determining environmental impacts due to the proposed improvements. The current schedule involves design, permitting, and construction plans to be completed in late 2020. Right-of-way acquisition is expected to begin in early 2021. Construction of the improvements is expected to begin in early 2023. This schedule is based on the current roundabout design. Changes to the design may affect the schedule. All efforts will be made to start construction as currently scheduled. Florida's Department of Transportation encourages you to send in any questions or comments you may have throughout the life of this project. Following this hearing, you can submit your comments to FDOT Project Manager Kathy Enoch through standard mail at 719 South Woodland Boulevard, Mail Station 542, Deland, Florida 32720, by email at kathleen.enot at dot.state.fl.us, or by telephone at 386-943-5149. This information is also available on the project website at www.cflroads.com. As a reminder, we will collect all questions and comments and provide responses at a later date. All comments and questions received by Monday, October 12, 2020 will be included as part of the public hearing record. For the latest project information, you can visit the project website by browsing to www.cflroads.com. Select the search icon. In the search box, enter 437-942-1 and hit go. Select the result 437-942-1 US 92 from the Halifax River Bridge to State Road A1A from the list. Here you can view project related documents and project contact information. Thank you. We will now begin the public testimony portion of tonight's hearing. As a reminder, staff will not be responding to comments or questions this evening. Written responses will be provided at a later date. Those participating online may type your comment or question into the question pane on the meeting control panel. If you would like to speak, please type your name followed by I wish to speak into the, into the question pane. Attendees who are participating at the remote viewing location, please fill out a speaker card if you would like to provide verbal comments at the microphone. A staff member will be around to collect the card shortly. If you are joining by phone only, you will not be able to provide verbal or typed in comments. Please submit your comments or questions directly to the FDUT project manager, Kathy Enoch, using standard mail at 719 South Woodland Boulevard, mail station 542, Deland, Florida 32720 by email at kathleen.enot at dot.state.fl.us or by telephone at 386-943-5149. Thank you. If you're holding a speaker card, Please raise your hand and staff will be by to collect them. We will now call upon those who've turned in speaker cards over or who have requested to speak via the question pane in GoToWebinar. In order to provide the same experience, we will rotate between calling on online and in-person participants to speak. As a reminder, online, please type into the question pane your first and last name and I wish to speak. When you come forward or are unmuted online, please state your name and address. If you represent an organization, municipality, or other public body, please provide that information as well. Due to the amount of people wishing to speak this evening, we ask that you input, we ask that you limit your input to two minutes. Please come to the microphone so that the recording will be able to get a complete record of your comments. If you are participating online, the coordinator will unmute you, but you will need to make sure you are also unmuted on your end. To tell if you are unmuted, the microphone icon next to your name should be green. If it is orange, or maybe it's red, <laughs> click it to unmute yourself and it should turn green. Kate, at this time, do we have anyone at the venue who has turned in 
a completed speaker card. Yes, Amanda, I have seven speaker cards. I do not have anyone that has requested to speak online yet. Can we go ahead and get started with those in the venue? And I will let you know if anyone requests to speak online. Um, yes, our first speaker, Bob Lloyd, if you could please come to the microphone, and state your name and address. Do I keep this on? Yeah, you can hear. Bob Lloyd, uh, 6210 Shoreline Drive, Fort Orange, Florida, 32127. I'm here on behalf of the Daytona Regional Chamber of Commerce. We are on record as supporting uh, this East ISB part, uh, project. We've been um, active participants and partners since the beginning uh, in 2013 and continue to be so. Uh, we were originally on record as supporting the roundabout, but we're okay with the enhanced signalization option. Um, I think the, the biggest issue that we want to emphasize is in 2013, uh, this project started and it is not supposed to begin construction until 2023. So for a decade, we have been talking about this project and we are hopeful that it can move forward. I think everybody is in agreement something needs to be done. And the businesses along that East ISB corridor have suffered longer than a decade. Uh, and we hope that we can bring this to a speedy conclusion for the business community along East ISB. We are anxious to see this begin. We appreciate uh, FDOT and everything that they've done to advance uh, this project on the calendar. And we appreciate uh, your attention tonight. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is Barbara Brown. If you would please come up to the microphone and state your name and your address. Um, hi, my name is Barbara Brown. We own a hotel in Daytona Beach Shores and we've had it for 50 years. And we have grave concerns regarding the roundabout. Um, I wanted to share its personal story that uh, affected us with a roundabout. Uh, we took a few years ago a trip to Ireland and while we were there we decided to rent a car at the airport with the GPS. So we get in the car with the GPS and as we're leaving the airport we approach the first roundabout which was not a busy roundabout and it said to for us to take the second exit. So the second right turn. So we get on the roundabout and we count one, two, we exit, GPS said wrong, recalculate. So we get back, start at the beginning again. So we thought, well, maybe we counted wrong. So we get back on the roundabout and we start at the beginning, start around the roundabout, exit one, exit two. We turn again on the second exit. It said, you're wrong, recalculating. So we get start third time around, we get back on, and as we get on, my husband says, we're taking the first exit. So we make the first right-hand turn, and apparently that was the right one, and we didn't realize the one we were on was the number one exit that we were on, and the second one was the second exit. So anyhow, it was so confusing that our concern is at a busy intersection, the one that we're talking about, um, that people could get quite confused if they're relying on something like we did, the GPS, I don't know if they all work like that, but um, also if they're unfamiliar with this area, they, you know, they could just pause a lot and it just may be very confusing to them. So we're concerned about safety and backups on all four, you know, approaches to the roundabout. And so that's the concerns that we wanted to share with everybody. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Kate, do you mind? I've got um, a couple people that have asked to speak online, so I'm going to jump in between you real quick so we don't get leave them hanging for too long. Laura Peterson, um, I'm going to unmute you in just a second here. Whenever you 
are unmuted, would you please state your name and address following your comment? Hi, my name is Laura Peterson. Okay, thanks, Laura. Thank you. I'm a uh, homeowner on 126 uh, Peninsula Drive. Um, I'm very excited for this project. Um, as somebody stated, it is overdue. Um, I have a few suggestions and also concerns. Uh, first of all, the roundabouts um, are my favorite aspect. Um, I do consider that we are beachside and considering uh, hurricanes and power outages, that would take care of that issue. Um, I have also traveled um, and they can be challenging. However, uh, GPSs have been updated and also signage is very important, which I would like to suggest that we make sure it's very clear with the signage. Um, the consideration for these lights on over at Beachside, we need help because the light wait time is atrocious. Specifically, I've seen people run lights because I've been waiting for them approximately eight minutes on the corner of Peninsula and um, Oak Ridge Bridge. Um, or, so we're talking about ISB. Um, my con concern and disappointment to see this project is neither one of them, either plan, light, or roundabout, has considered bicycle pathways. And I think that for both residents on the island, we like to park our cars and not take them out when we get home. Um, and also for the tourists that we are, we have here, I think that that would encourage some local um, bicycle traffic and rentals and encourage the, the entrepreneurship for that. Um, one other thing that I did want to say was that, um, has there been any consideration for the roundabout um, for the backup of beach access because even though that that does seem to increase the flow of traffic anywhere I've traveled, the backup on the beach access may be a consideration or a concern. That's it. Thanks. Laura, thank you for your comment. Um, I have Doug Hall. Mr. Hall, I'm going to unmute you in just one second here. Okay. okay. This and is Doug Hall. I live at 1405 Edgewater Road in Daytona Beach. I belong to the Halifax Council of the Blind and serve as an advisor with the River to CTPO on the Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee and the TDLCB. Uh, I have two, two issues. One, whether we go with the enhanced traditional signalization or around about, I insist that every crossing have an accessible pedestrian signal to allow people who are print impaired or visually impaired to be able to cross safely. Um, I haven't heard anything about installation of APSs on either one of those options. That's number one. Number two, I want to know if, regardless of what what option is chosen, I want to know if it is what are we going to do about enforcement of the law? You can tell people anything you want for them to obey the law. What are we going to do about making sure people do obey the law? That's my two points. Doug, thank you for your comment. Um, do you, since you and Nancy are sharing a line, do you want to go ahead and let Nancy leave her comment as well while we're on? Go ahead. Yes. Um, I basically have the same thing um, as Doug. However, I wanted to add a question about the speed limit because um, cars, when they see the hybrid beacon, need to have time to stop. Uh, and number two, will there be police present for the first six weeks or certain amount of time and also during um, heavy um, traffic times? Because um, what I see around town with um, our existing traffic signals is that people have cut in front of me numerous times when I've had the pedestrian light and, um, and the green light. So um, this town and many in Florida don't seem to respect pedestrians. 
And if the police aren't going to enforce the law, then there's no sense in having a roundabout because at least we have a little bit more safety with the um, signals. All right, thank you for your comment, Nancy. Kate, if you'd like to take um, the next speaker from the venue, and then I have one lined up online to go after that. Yes, our next speaker is William Bitford. Yes. Please state your name and address before your comment. Oh, my name is William oh, Bitford. Wait, at the microphone, please. <laughs> Sorry, but I didn't come dressed properly. I was just cleaning up the properties. Uh, my address is, uh, 402 East International Speedway, 535, 40, 326 South Grandview. I own about five acres off of the uh, East ISB corridor. Um, I really, I really think whatever we do should be a positive flow for, you know, that the Brown and Brown Corporation started on Beach Street um, and have it flow straight straight down, whatever it is that happens, whether it's the roundabout or it's the traffic light. I think I'd just rather see everybody just happy. As long as something happens, it's better than nothing happening. Um, I've been talking to a lot of other people on the East ISB corridor to create a coalition so we can work hand in hand with companies, you know, like, like uh, Robert has or, or with the chamber to try to create something that's going to be friendly to people driving down the corridor, which is really the artery to the heart, which is the beach. Everybody comes here to go to the beach. Let's try to do something that flows with what Mr. Uh, what Brown and Brown Corporation is doing and other corporations like that are doing in town. I don't have much to say other than I, I see some of my neighbors here and, you know, I've, I'm just... I see uh, Mr. Strickland here, which he's definitely given me some great advice. Uh, we've been trying to beautify East ISB for some time, but due to the CRA rules, the city won't let me put new businesses on a lot of my properties. They let me use it as parking lots uh, and things like that. They make it more easy to take uses away than to give me more uses to do something. And that's the main part of the problem of uh, why it's degrading so poorly and why it's hurting us so bad as people are coming to town. I think that if we all work together along with FDOT and the leadership we have in this room today, that we're gonna see a new Daytona in the next two years, three years, I'm ready to do a development and I'd like to, to do something with everybody in this room. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry I'm not dressed right. I'm, I was doing some asphalt stuff on my property. <laughs> I love you guys. Thank you. We appreciate your comment. Thank you. And I love Daytona. All right. Thank you for your comment. Jeff Brower online. I'm going to unmute you here in just a second. Um, please state your name and address along with your comment. All right, Mr. Brower, you should be able to unmute yourself. Hey, thank you. I've this is this is very, very interesting. I'm really glad to hear it. Thank you for all the work that has gone into it. Please continue. Um, I'd I'd like to see it happen as as fast as possible, but we do need to get it right. I just the the things that I thought of as you went through all of the options, um, which were uh, which were really good. Uh, was that I, I like the light option because I'm, I think like most uh, residents here are very concerned that the traffic will back up from the beach into the intersection. And then that will um, cause a call to um, close that approach and we'll lose another uh, approach to the beach. We'll lose more beach access. So uh, I like the light option. I uh, would also suggest uh, opening up the traffic both north and south when they get to the beach, uh, all the way down to the boardwalk, and that will help revive Main Street at the same time we revive East ISB. 
I think the the options should be it seems to be speeding up traffic. I would like to see the option be to um, slow down traffic. This should be a, a um, retail area, a shopping district, a place that's safe to uh, to bicycle and to walk on. Um, it's a tourist area, but it's also an area that will be greatly enjoyed by our current residents. So let's slow down the traffic. Um, I would remove the median. Let's forget the median because if if we do, we're going to have to uh, take too much of the um, property from businesses along East ISB. Uh, the the very very popular um, pizza restaurant there will be destroyed if we take more of his property. Let's be respectful of the properties that are there. Forget the median. Do the wide sidewalks. We have to have bike lanes. Um, add the bike lanes and and add street trees along the side, not down the median. And, and uh, those would just those are are would be my suggestions um, that we really focus on building up the uh, the retail business there and, and make it uh, inviting for people to come in, let people stay there on the street and visit the businesses, um, not just speed them along. Um, uh, but I'm I'm very encouraged. Thank you. Let's let's keep moving. Jeff, thank you for your comment. Kate, if you would like to take the next speaker from the uh, in-person venue. Our next speaker is Vera Weatherholtz. Um, please come up to the microphone and state your name and address. Oh, Vern, I'm sorry. I thought that was an A on the end. I do apologize, sir. My name is Vern Weatherholtz. I live at Three Granville Circle, Daytona Beach, 32118. Uh, the things that I've been saying uh, through all the meetings that the traffic lanes are 11 foot. I think if that's, I don't know whether they're using that as traffic calming or whatever, but if you've ever been behind a bus on the existing lanes are narrow anyways, I would suggest that the lane should be either 12 to 12 and a half feet wide each one and narrow down the median. A 15 foot medium is uh, too large for that area. And I don't think that we need that. We need the travel lanes to be safe. What people have to realize that the amount of tourism that we have coming to Daytona Beach they don't know where they're at. They don't know where they're going. They're looking around and the only thing that they can see is the ocean in front of them. So to keep it safe for buses and the traffic moving, uh, I think that the lanes need to be wider. Uh, another thing at Halifax Road where it comes out on ISB, they've got a light there. It's always a problem because people coming south on Halifax, they always they want to turn left heading east and they're always in the middle of the road my suggestion would be to no light there have us and just have a right lane turn coming south on halifax and not any turn lane going north on halifax that's just a traffic hazard the intersections between Halifax and Peninsula are too close to have that type of signalization. Uh, the, main, the main item is the roundabout. I think it's, it's just going to become a hassle. I understand that DOT all over the United States is recommending uh, roundabouts for accidents. If you did a, a true traffic count and and see how many T-bones are at that intersection or head on. I think the signalization would be the best. I also think it would be the safest for any pedestrians. Like the gentleman said with the blind, it's a little wider, a little longer, but I think it would be more safe. And, uh, you know, to keep the traffic movement is the utmost what DOT should be looking for. If there's turning lanes on each intersection at A1A, I think would be very beneficial and help the traffic move. Thank you. 
Thank you for your comment. Our, our next speaker is Mark Antonio. You can please come up to the microphone and state your name and address. Thank you, Mark Anito. I reside in Ormond Beach. Um, first, I want to thank FDOT for this uh, presentation. Very professional. I understand the staff. There's enough staff here, and a lot of work has gone into this uh, presentation a lot better than we had about a year and a half ago. So thanks a lot for FDOT for this. And uh, echoing <clears throat> a previous speaker, let's not blow this opportunity to bring this needed change um, to Daytona Beach. I drive up and down Daytona Beach and, and as far south as um, <clears throat> Fort St. Lucie and up to Jacksonville. And I just got back from a trip to uh, Cottonwood, Arizona to see my daughter. She lives in Cottonwood and she works in Sedona. And <clears throat> I counted probably 25 roundabouts in that uh, tourist section. And there's a lot of traffic in Sedona. But, and I talked to one of the engineers there because I'm an environmental engineer. And he did say that most of Arizona is going to roundabouts. And if you've been to Sedona, there's a lot of traffic there. It's a, it's a, it's a nightmare but they seem to uh, work out okay in, in Sedona, which has, in my opinion, more traffic. And it's in Sedona, it's 365 days a year traffic. So I think we should give the roundabout an, op an option, give it a chance. There's enough engineers in FDOT and also the city of Daytona to engineer the, the backup, which may or may not happen. A couple options that I can give to the, to the FDOT and the city is to, uh, put the toll booths uh, onto the beach a little bit farther, make additional lanes um, ent entering the beach or direct all the traffic that's traveling east on, a east on uh, ISB, direct that traffic south on A1A, buy some land on the west right of way of A1A, make a, a jug handle U-turn where you can queue up the traffic there, put a light, traffic signal, and then when the when the traffic is diverted back onto A1A, it heads north, you can queue up the traffic uh, northward in a couple of lanes. So that's my suggestion. And, uh, but again, I wanna thank uh, FDOT and, uh, and oh, hopefully too, the city of Daytona will give some input into this, but uh, um, uh, that's it for my comments and thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is John Nicholson. If you could please come up to the microphone and state your name and address. John Nicholson, 413 North Granby Avenue, Daytona Beach. I'm a few blocks from this. I travel the road all the time. Uh, we first looked at this 25, 30 years ago with Suzanne Kewen. We've been waiting for 25, 30 years for something to be done. So I understand the need to, uh, and all the people that want it done right away, but I would rather have it done correctly than have a problem. And I see there is a problem. Uh, for several years, I had to take care of my mother in Miami. They put her in a nursing home and I had to travel past an intersection that is a roundabout, exactly what you're proposing with one truncated side. It would back up because of the dynamics for a mile or two on both 164th Street and 87th Avenue. We have the same problem here. We must stop every car at the toll booth, which is not that far from A1A. So your diagrams that you showed a nice flow. Well, the problem is you were showing one car when there was actually five or 10 going seven months out of the year. So there will be a backup there. And when it backs up, especially with the two lanes, there's nowhere to go because people are coming from the West trying to get to the beach they will be in both of those lanes because they don't know which lane to get to. So they will stop in both of those lanes waiting to get around the roundabout. People coming from the shores will want to go onto the beach, make it the right-hand turn, which should be very short. But if their car is sitting there, they're not going anywhere. So it's going to create a, a really cluster at that location. So what I'm asking you to consider the signalized light, which is the better choice, but also to get the cars that are turning and you want to widen the two lanes, you know, on the north, uh, the southwest side, 
of the intersection and the north, east corner, whatever, you want to widen those. My suggestion is the city owns both of those properties where you want, want to widen it, but you have a cut lane or a side road that goes across that vacant property that the city owns, and you will take 10 to 15 cars off that uh, intersection so that you can have a lane that goes directly onto the beach only and two lanes that'll head north. Likewise, when you're heading south, you will get off to the right at the uh, Hennessy property, and you don't get to the intersection at all if you want to make a right-hand turn. You've already gotten off the road. So those that traffic will go directly into the shores. Two lanes will go directly into the shores, and one lane will go onto the beach. With your roundabout, would you have those singular lanes like that? What happens when somebody is in the left-hand lane and they want, because there's two lanes to the beach. So what happens when they're in the left-hand lane and they want to get to the right-hand lane? So they have, and it's a very short intersection, even with that roundabout. They're going to have to literally fight each other to get into that one lane. You only have one lane onto the beach. And that's the problem. You're going to have three lanes trying to get into that beach approach, which is bad enough to start with two lanes. So when you narrow it to that one lane, you're really going to cause a problem. So we've been looking at this for a number of years. I, I stood at that intersection probably six months every morning, watching the traffic, timing the traffic, so that I knew what was happening. Even if the city widens that road, okay, to allow four lanes and put four toll booths onto the beach, it will still back up because they have to stop for two to three minutes whether you have a beach pass or not, and explain every single time to every single car what the rules are to the beach. It is extremely time consuming. And I don't believe you all calculated the fact that these cars must stop for that length of time. And we have seven months, six to seven months. It's not just like one, to, one or two small periods. The end of January, February, March, and April, we have tourists. June, July, and half of August, we have tourists. That's over half the year. We must consider the maximum. I know you guys say, oh, no, we don't do maximums. We only do minimums. Well, that doesn't help us at all. Because for seven months, you're going to ask us to have that stopped traffic at that location. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. I've got um, someone online ready to speak, Tom Gathman. I'm going to unmute you here. You may have to unmute yourself on your end. Okay, looks like you're unmuted, Tom. Okay, thank you. Uh, my concern, well, I, I'm Tom Gathman. I live in Omer Beach, but I, I work in Daytona Beach Shores at a hotel. Our concern is during event weeks, bike week, race week, we have, you know, 200,000 bikes that come down during bike week and, and we're sold out. Our concern is when you get to the roundabout, when you have, it, it, it's a backlog already. So when you get to the roundabout, how is, how are the bikes going to conform to the roundabout? Because I've only been in two roundabouts myself. And the, the first one was very confusing because I've never done it before. So when you have the roundabout and maybe during that those weeks, we have a lot of emergency vehicles that come in, whether it's beach or ambulance or police or fire. How, how will that be handled with the, the load of traffic? Because during bike week, race week, we get back up right now, like two blocks back. So how will that be handled? Thank you. All right, thank you for your comment, Tom. Kate, if you'd um, like to take the next person at the venue. It's um, with Mazzy, and I'm sorry, I can't read your last name. It starts with a W. Oh, well, I'm sorry, thank you. Please state your name and your address at the microphone. It's Mazzy Welch, <clears throat> 266 Morningside Avenue. Um, you all talk about the start date, but how long is this going to last, uh, completion date? Are there going to be fines and penalties for going over the, the completion date? 
Um, I've been told the speed in the roundabout will be 30 miles an hour. I can't believe we're going to do that circle in 30 miles an hour. Every roundabout I've been on, speed is reduced to 15. Instant backup in all directions. Um, the video simulation had far too few cars heading eastbound on it. Totally unrealistic. Maybe that was at 6.30 in the morning on a weekday, not the weekend. Um, light option, I can see that $24 million for something that's going to be a constant backup for months, like the gentleman said, is just insane. Um, the problem is really the ramp. There aren't enough lanes going on to the beach, so there's always a backup. Add more lanes to the ramp to the beach, and the light will work. The light option will work and pedestrians will be safe bicycles be safe we'll all be safe so i think that's it oh and isb could have been beautified years ago there was no reason to wait on that trees alongside bushes alongside property owners why didn't you do it whoever thank you Thank you for your comment. Um, Bob Davis, please come to the microphone and state your name and address before you comment. Well, Bob Davis, 2209 South Atlantic Avenue, uh, Daytona Beach Shores. I represent the Lodging and Hospitality Association of Volusia County. We have uh, 100 hotels with 10,000 members. We have 150 allied members from timeshares to condos, to restaurants, to gift shops to all kinds of hospitality. First, let me comment and say thank you to the uh, FDOT uh, for their concerns and finally getting to this area. And the Chamber of Commerce has been a driver for many years and uh, we thank them for all their hard work. Absolutely, positively, no to roundabouts. Absolutely, positively, no to roundabouts. Years ago, for most of you people in this room, we had a roundabout off a bridge. You were born here at that time. We had more deaths, more accidents, and more collisions. If you ever been to Hollywood, Florida, you go around that circle for a half a day. There's a, a, a roundabout they just put in Clearwater Beach. There's a young lady that lives in Port Orange. She has a hotel. It takes three hours to get to the hotel. As a matter of fact, she called me last week, and one of the brides, uh, missed her wedding because she couldn't get through the roundabout. Now, a couple of months ago, we met at Emory Riddle, uh, the Speedway, the Chamber, Billy Wheeler, your great uh, uh, county councilwoman, myself, uh, the Speedway, and it was brought to light at that particular meeting that the figures that we got were from Monday to Friday afternoon. So I don't know if they changed the figures on the maps today, but what about Friday night? What about Saturday? What about Sunday? And the people that go to the beach? How about the Ocean Center? How about the Peabody Auditorium? How about the graduations? How about the events and the charity groups and the banquets that will come back to Volusia County? The gentleman that went to Sarone, uh, Arizona, wonderful. I, I, I totally agree with you, but that ain't Daytona Beach. There's only three big areas, Granada, ISB and uh, Dunlawton Boulevard to get to the beach. And if you go there and you see the cars that are backed up, they're going to be to the speedway. And this young lady just talked about the beautification of ISB. What's wrong with the heart line to the city where the most taxes are paid and the businesses need to thrive? We absolutely, positively, all the hotels, and if uh, Billy Worley will stand up, she is firmly against the roundabout and she is our great uh, county council woman, and we're gonna stand there with pickets and not let them build a roundabout. It will kill the business on the uh, east side, and we need to help this gentleman. He wants to develop, but you can't develop with a roundabout because more cars will crash, more people will be injured, and if you go to Clearwater, just go to Clearwater. The, the Department of Transportation said it's the only way. Well, ask the people there that have businesses. They have no more businesses. Thank you. Wow. 
by the way, Ken, for the three million visitors to Volusia County last year, 10.2 million visitors to a community of 585,000 people. We do a lot of business here. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is Mike Manderville. If you'd please come up to the microphone and state your name and address. Hi, I'm Mike Manderville. I'm a beachside resident, Daytona Beach. Um, well, after that, I'm going to be the minority here. Um, I've driven, I used to drive professionally for many years and stuff, and um, I've been to a lot of cities with a lot of roundabouts. Uh, you can take like Boston, which has tremendous traffic with the Cambridge area, has roundabouts. I used to drive a truck to go through them. Um, they work. People got to give them a chance. Um, I've heard people say that uh, the traffic during bike week and all that stuff, but we have that now with the light already. Even if you have more lanes, the traffic's still going to be backed up with the light. It doesn't really matter. Um, the other thing I was going to say is one thing that's going to back it up a lot is uh, the pedestrians going across is going to stop the cars. Have you considered building walkovers? It may cost more money. But if we're going to do this, let's do it right. Daytona has area has a history of doing things wrong and getting them wrong. So let's do it right. If it costs more money, we got to put walkovers to let the pedestrians walk around this route about easily. Let's do it. Um, the other thing I had was um, people mentioned the beach, the backups on the beach. If they haven't noticed this last summer, the beach has actually been doing something about that. They're putting um, a canopy on the beach and they're taking cars that have to sign up and stuff down onto the beach and doing it. They're not keeping them in the lanes. So that actually has helped a lot. Um, I agree with the other woman that said, um, if they're going to build this and do this, it's it's taken too long already to get the ISP taken care of. Let's get it done. Let's do it right. And let's make sure the contracts are in place that enforce these builders to stick to their word and not like the bridge where it runs over, not like the homeless shelter where it runs over for an extra year or whatever. Let's get it done right. Brown and Brown has proven that you can build stuff and do it right and do it quickly. Brown and Brown built that building way faster than they could build a single story homeless shelter, which is ridiculous. Um, and I think that's about it. Um, but I do really like the ideas of the walkovers to eliminate the pedestrian. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker, um, Rick Brown, please come to the microphone and um, state your name and address. Yeah, Rick Brown, I live in Beachside, 1508 Crescent Ridge. Um, for some of us who are old enough to remember what Daytona looked like in the early 60s, it's changed a lot. Uh, the 10.2 is only going to get bigger. You know, we want a lot of really attractive events, the bike weeks, some of the other events, I'm not a big fan of the truck weeks, but the bike weeks have been a tradition here for many, many, many years. And it brings a lot of money to the economy. Now, if any of you from the DOT have been here doing these events for any period of time, you would know what goes on. And you have people from all over the country here riding uh, and of course the tourists in here as well it would create a tremendous amount of confusion road rage and issues people trying to go the wrong way and stuff like that now just so you know i grew up in an era when they first started doing traffic circles as this gentleman mentioned up in boston uh and but new jersey used quite a few of them now I've read all the reports for the floor, the, the, the kind of involved engineering reports on accident rates. They paint a somewhat rosy picture of roundabouts and circles. They work well in some places. There's some of them in uh, some of the neighborhoods there that work well. Okay, They slow the traffic down, allow flow. In a heavy traffic area, it is a complete disaster. People will become confused, and those of us who have been around tourists long enough know tourists get confused real easy. And Florida Department of Transportation has done an excellent job over the years of doing these really nice presentations. But when you get to the realism of what really happens, I'd like to see you do a video if you actually had this in here and what a complete nightmare it is. We have the problems with the beach access. 
And, uh, you know, I know the, our, our uh, county representative, Mrs. Wheeler, uh, she's definitely, you know, on the right, right side with that. Um, the reports, as I mentioned in Florida, are all real rosy. Okay. Again, you have to look at the whole picture. Now, read the federal reports, the ones by the U.S. government, which cover the whole country. The accident rate is actually higher, despite what you read in the Florida reports. That's the truth of the matter, okay? And you can read them online. It takes a little digging and whatnot. They're all there. They're very lengthy, a lot of reading to do. I've done all that. The fact of the matter is there are always more accidents in a circle, especially when you have high traffic areas. So my suggestion, if you go through with this, make sure you put a little uh, booth for personal injury attorneys to pass out business cards. Yeah, exactly. Dan and the whole rest of them. Anyway, the point is there will be more accidents. Now, what Florida DOT says is that, well, there are less, uh, uh, less fatalities, okay? Now, <clears throat> that's true because when you hit or, or less total damage, although the price of accidents is outrageous anymore, because you're deflecting rather than straight head-ons, okay? What there's, the fact of the matter is there is more accidents, period. Now, envision this whole circle on a busy Saturday morning or during bike week or during any one of our events that we have here. You, you've now closed off all the roads. The beach access, north-south on A1A, and now you're going to force everybody down all the side streets, okay? And for those, I know some of my neighbors live in that area. They know what I'm talking about, okay? They're gonna, you're going to have all kinds. Of, I already have it in my neighborhood. They come roaring through, especially those big trucks. You know, they put up these barricades, but that's not going to stop them. There's going to be road rage. There's going to be confusion with the drivers. And then there's going to be people that just say, I'm going to find another pass. Everybody has GPS now. Oh, we got a little side street. So they start going through all the neighborhoods. You know, and yeah, the Daytona Police Department will start writing out lots of tickets and bring in revenue. I get that, but it doesn't solve the problem. And they can't stop everybody. And it doesn't make for good relationships. Yeah, tourists can be you know, a bit of a pain sometimes, but they're our lifeblood. We are a tourist attraction, you know, the world's most famous beach. And despite some of the city people, I, I hope someday we'll get back to the glory we once had. But my main point in all this is this is the world's worst location. And as I mentioned, New Jersey used quite a few of them. Okay, that was kind of the, the way back in the 50s, right? The problem was, again, a lot of accidents, a lot of driver confusion. So for those of you that are in the DOT that aren't as old as some of us that we can remember, you will note that New Jersey has now eliminated all their circles. Why? Too many problems, too many accidents. Now that's a high traffic state, okay? You can quote, okay, how many cars per year? Well, let's look at Saturday morning, people going to the beach, stacked up trying to get in. And the other side of that is Sunday afternoon, trying to get home. And there's several other problems that this particular stretch of road has. We have a railroad track on the other side. And unless you either do a bridge over or an underpass under, you will never get rid of that problem when a train comes. You will now not only lock up everything inland, you will lock up everything on beach side because there's no way around the mess. And once you get caught in this, you want to talk about road rage? It's going to be insane, absolutely insane, because people are just, especially when it starts raining. And those of us who live here know it rains in the afternoon. Well, that's when everybody leaves the beach at the same time, okay? So you can talk so many cars per hour, so many cars per year, et cetera. What you have to look at is the peak. And of course, we haven't even talked about hurricane evacuation. Well, when it comes to hurricane evacuation, it is a nightmare trying to get off of here, especially if there's a lot of people on the beach at the same time. So, you know, I just see this as nothing but one big backlog one big opportunity for personal attorneys to make a lot of money and one big opportunity for uh, a very unpleasant experience, not only for the tourists, but of course, all the residents in the area. It's gonna be a disaster. There are correct ways of doing this. This is not it. And I've been to several of the DOT meetings and you know I'll continue to attend them, but I will tell you of all the places you guys wanna put a, a, a roundabout circle, this is the wrong one. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. 
That was our last speaker card. Does anyone else wish to speak here at the remote viewing location? Uh, Chris Taramina, 315 South Grandview. Um, a lot of the complaints I've been hearing about the, any way you want to go with this project is the beach access. I want to know why we insist on having beach access at such a busy intersection as international. We used to have a beach access at Silver Beach, which is a ghost town. There's nothing around it. There's a big lot next door. You can make eight lanes of toll booths going onto the beach and a one-way road to come out at international, making it an exit. Exiting the beach is just traffic. When you're going onto the beach, you gotta stop, you gotta pay to get in or show your ticket, whatever they do with those toll booths. So let's do that offsite where it's less congested and let's let the international uh, intersection be an intersection. Because as the cars come off, they're just traffic. If they back up on the beach to get off the beach, they're just waiting for a traffic light or they're waiting for their spot in the circle. You know, you can still drive on the beach, you just make it a one-way road. I don't know. I did, uh, Chris Taramina, 315 South Grandview. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, would you like to speak as well? Did you? Oh, your speaker card's in the box? Okay, <laughs> we'll find it. Uh, my name is Sally Pemberton. I'm at 911 Village Lake Drive. I do live in DeLand now, but I have worked and lived in Daytona Beach and Ormond Beach since the early 70s. And um, to my reference point regarding the roundabout, um, roundabouts are perfect in the right location. Uh, we have one in DeLand on 44 that slows the traffic. It, it funnels the, the cars through perfectly. And that was a great location for a roundabout. However, I'm gonna take a left turn here. <laughs> this location is horrible for a roundabout. The um, Seabreeze Circle, which some of us remember, I was a teenager. I actually had a t-shirt that said, I survived. Seabreeze Circle. <laughs> the idea that this is a gateway coming to the world's most famous beach and that the traffic is supposed to funnel through and continuously flow is that's, in my opinion, wrong <laughs> in, to begin with. People are coming to Daytona Beach and that intersection is a destination, number one. People are actually probably glad when they get a red light and they're sitting in traffic and they can take their pictures of the ocean <laughs> and whatever, and they have time to absorb that they're finally here. So my reason for coming tonight is just to support the signal um, at this location, not a roundabout at this location. Um, I also, one other comment, I remember from the Seabreeze Circle, that people would get in the circle and just keep driving. <laughs> this is Daytona Beach. That happens. <laughs> and um, so unless we have a police presence, I, you know, I don't know how you would stop that, but definitely you're gonna have the thrill seekers, the people that want to do that. Um, accidents perhaps are less severe because of the angle. Again, I remember from the Seabury Circle, you had fender benders like crazy and because there was so much happening and sailboats and same situation. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, we have a few more online comments that we're gonna go to now. Hey, thanks, Kate. Mr. Hall, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you here in just a second. If you'd please just state your name address, you know the drill, okay, <laughs> here you go. All right, you're unmuted. Okay. This is Doug Hall again, 1405 Edgewater Road in Daytona Beach. I have two points I wanna make. Number one, the, the task, the job of the DOT as well as the TPO, unfortunately, it seems like the task is 
to move cars. That's not our purpose. The purpose should be to move people. Cars are needed to move those people, but we should be focusing on people, not cars. Therefore, DOT and the other things should be looking at pedestrian and bicycle safety as well as moving cars. That's number one. Number two is safety. We talked about roundabouts. Well, roundabouts may be good, may not be good. I have experienced both. A few years ago, I was in Plymouth, New Hampshire, Plymouth, Massachusetts, and there was a roundabout. The drivers were very polite. They were courteous. They were wonderful. When I approached the roundabout, the car stopped because I wanted to cross or they thought I wanted to cross. Here, you cross the street and I swear it's almost like, let's get them. Or it's like, let's get through the intersection before that pedestrian gets in the way. A lot of it is related to the courtesy of the drivers. And that, that courtesy is not gonna happen unless the laws are enforced. I've crossed several times when cars all cut me off. Where's the police? Nowhere, because they're off doing something else. And if we don't enforce the law, it's not going to happen. And um, that's my point. All right, thank you, Mr. Hall. I believe uh, Ms. Ann Ruby wanted to make a comment this evening. Ann, if I go ahead and unmute you in just a second, are you ready? All right, I've got you unmuted on this end. If you could just um, unmute yourself. There you go. All right, thank you. Thank you so much for this presentation tonight. Um, I just have two points. Uh, one is I lived in Boston for 20 years. I am absolutely in love with roundabouts. They work very well there. I don't think this is a good place for a roundabout. And I think it has to do with what John Nicholson said is that there's one short leg coming out of it and that that could get things backed up. So while I am a fan of roundabouts, I don't think it's the best place for a roundabout at this intersection. So that's my opinion on that. Um, the other thing I wanted to do um, as chairman of the BMW Beachside Neighborhood Watch, um, typically this is our meeting night and I'm grateful so many people came to this meeting, it's wonderful. But I'd like to invite you all to attend our rescheduled meeting Monday, October 5th at Lenox Park at 6.30. Bring your own chair. And the League of Women Voters will be there to discuss the re ballot referendum. And again, thank you so much to you guys at FDOT. All right, thank you, Ms. Ruby. Kate, do you have anyone? at the in-person venue that would like to speak at this time? Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Oh, okay, yes. Okay. Did you fill out a speaker card? No, ma'am, I was taking notes and okay. seeing what was going on before I could come up with thoughts and ideas. And I hope everybody can hear me. This is kind of, I like to look at people when you talk to see their reactions. So, but anyways, um, I haven't lived in Daytona Beach as long as some of you, but I do have an issue with the roundabout because I've been a professional driver for a long time with all due respect to the driver that was here before. I've got a lot of miles and a lot of time having to deal with traffic and people in Florida, around the country too, don't understand traffic laws and it's gonna be a mess there. You're looking at ultimately six lanes of traffic trying to get to that beach, whether you got southbound, eastbound or northbound in a roundabout. Also, I haven't heard anything addressed about semis. If anybody's ever seen semis in a roundabout, it ain't gonna happen. Go to, go to Louisiana. They have a roundabout built where they've got truck stops and it's a mess. They got accidents all day long. People try to drive under the trucks because they're trying to get through in the trucks. The trucks, it's not made for a semi, no matter what you do. So that's an issue. Um, Traffic law enforcement, that's an issue. The numbers and the signage. People don't pay attention to the sign as it is. So for me, I see it. Cause like I said, I see a lot every day. I drive every day, that's what I do. And it scares me to be on the road with some of these people. 
and a roundabout with our events, nobody's taken into that account. There's, there's just like the gentleman said, 10.2 million. It ain't going to happen. It's just not going to happen. I don't, I don't, you know, that's just the way it is. And if you've been a professional driver like I have for the years and the miles I've got, it's a scary thought having it down there. What do you do? Thank you. Excuse me, sir. Um, could you please state your name in the microphone? We didn't get that for our record. My name is Bob Diedrich and I'm in Daytona Beach. All right, Mr. Gath Gathman, I'm going to unmute you here. Okay, you should be good to go. Hi. So, yeah, I just want to add, this is Tom Gathman. I live in Orm Beach, but I work in, in Daytona Beach Shores. And I'd like to comment on what Bob Davis said earlier is about the uh, the beach access. Because, again, I I emphasize on the special events with truck week, jeep week, which we didn't have this year, but we will next year, uh, bike week and so on. The beach access actually gets lined up back onto A1A. So how will this roundabout help with that, with getting um, getting all this traffic in? Because that's going to block one whole circle. So everybody's going to have to go to the inside circle, which is to continue around. But again, how will this help our our, our backup and our special events? You know, during the week we're slow. So roundabout is fine, but on the weekends and special events, I think it's really going to cause a lot of congestion, uh, more so because people are not used to roundabouts, you know, and I see a lot of issues with this. So thank you. All right. Thank you for your comment. Is there anyone at the in-person venue that would like to speak that hasn't already? Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Nope. I don't think we have any additional speakers, Amanda. Anyone else online? Give you just a second here. I would like to remind everybody that the Florida Department of Transportation encourages you to comment and ask questions throughout the life of the project. However, all comments and questions received by Monday, October 12th will be included as a part of this hearing's record. And you can do that by mailing your comments directly to Kathy Enot at Florida Department of Transportation District 5, 719 South Woodland Boulevard, mail station 542, Deland, Florida 32720 by calling Kathy at 386-943-5149 or by sending email at kathleen.enot at dot.state.fl.us. Okay. Looks like everyone got their chance to speak. If not, again, this is all goes on the project record if it's in by Monday, October 12th. So if you didn't get to speak tonight or if you want to go home and think of um, think the project through a little bit more, you can email Kathy um, or send her your comment. So the time is now 7.23. Thank you for attending this public hearing and for providing your input. I hereby officially close the public hearing for the International Speedway Boulevard, US 92, State Road 600 corridor improvements. A, a recording of tonight's oral proceedings together with all written material received as a part of the hearing record and displays will be available at the district office for public review upon request and a recording of tonight's hearing will also be posted on the project website um, within the next few days. Thank you again and have a great evening everyone. Thank you and could you also please make sure to turn in your blue signing card you can either give it to a project team member with the name tag or put it in one of the comment boxes in the back room.